Have you guys ever said that you were going to do something and then either you forgot or something suddenly came up and you didn't get around to doing it? Remember one time not long ago, Jeannie said, could you go to the post office and pop this in the mail? And I said, I will. And later on in the day, did you remember to pop that in the post office? Oh, I forgot. I said I was going to do it and I forgot. I'll go out right away and pop it in the mail. We do it all the time. We're forgetful. Sometimes it's just our minds go blank. Stuff like that happens. Well, in Genesis chapter 17, God says, I will, 12 times. And not only did he say, I will, he did. <laughs> Genesis chapter 17. This is 13 years later, after the situation with Hagar and Ishmael and Abram and Sarai still don't have any children together. And maybe Abram was starting to think, well, God's forgotten about me. That was a long time ago. Maybe this promise was something I heard wrong. Maybe it was something to inspire me at the time, but obviously God has forgotten me. Genesis 17, verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. And maybe this was a representation. Maybe this was Jesus, or maybe it was God himself appearing in the person of the angel of the Lord. But it says the Lord appeared to him. So I think we're dealing with the Father or Jesus. And I'd say Jesus because John 1.18 says no one has seen the Father at any time. I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. And in Hebrew, God Almighty is El Shaddai. And there's a lot of conversation about how to translate El Shaddai. Shaddai could come from the verb Shada, which means to pour out. So I am the God who pours out blessing upon you. I am the God who pours out favor upon you. And I, I like that idea very much. But most translators say that Shaddai comes from a noun that means mountain or strength or help. And this speaks of God as a mountain of strength. God is a mountain of help. God representing his power. I am God Almighty. And that and it makes sense to translate it that way because 12 times he says, I will, as a demonstration of the power that he's going to implement. Walk before me faithful, faithfully. That means live a life of devotion and allegiance and loyalty and love for me and my commandments. That's what it means to walk before God. And be blameless. Well, if that means be perfect, holy man, we're in big trouble. But I think blameless means single-hearted devotion, total devotion. That's what God is demanding of Abram. And I like how he introduces, reintroduces himself. Because in order to really turn to God, sometimes we need a fresh reminder of who it is we're dealing with. We need a fresh recall that God is not just some dusty figure on the pages of history. He is El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. He is the greatest of all times. And so God reintroduces Abram to himself. I am the Almighty. And because of who I am, you need to walk before me. Ooh, good stuff. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. And then Abram fell face down. What is he thinking? He's thinking, well, I'm 99 years old. There's not a lot of guys my age having kids no more. <laughs> how, am I, how are my numbers <laughs> going to increase greatly? He falls on his face before El Shaddai. God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. He's reminding Abram of what he already told him in Genesis 12 and in Genesis 15. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will your name be Abram. Abram means exalted father, which a lot of people must have thought was a joke because for so many years he wasn't the father of anything. He didn't have any kids. Well, the joke's about to get a little bit funnier. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be called Abraham, which means father of many. I have made you a father of many nations. And that must have 
Abram must have been thinking, is this a joke? I mean, <laughs> I've got one kid, and he's not a kid by my wife. I'm 99 years old. I'm not as young as I used to be. Why is he calling me father of many? Why is he changing my name? I will make you very fruitful, God says. I will make nations of you. This is getting better all the time. And kings will come from you. It's not just you're going to have a whole lot of grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. There's going to be awesome kings that come from your body. And, of course, we know who they are. David, Solomon, and then someone by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ are all going to come from this line of Abraham. I will, verse 7, I will establish my agreement, I'll establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Notice all the I wills. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you. I will establish my covenant with you. This is a unilateral, unconditional covenant that God is making with Abraham. Abraham doesn't have to do anything to earn it or deserve it. God is choosing him, and God says, I am El Shaddai, and I will do it. Verse 8, the whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of stuff. Sometimes after a long time, we sometimes wonder, where is God? I haven't heard from God. I haven't felt close to God in a long time. Has he forgotten about me? Has he blown me off? Is he busy doing other things? And so how important it is to get a fresh review, revelation of the greatness of our God and how he has not forgotten. Verse 9, then God said to Abraham, as for you, you know, it's not like you're going to sit around and twiddle your thumbs. You need to keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. And then he goes on to talk about the right of circumcision, that everyone in male in your household needs to be circumcised. Since God is making an agreement that he's going to multiply the flesh of Abraham so that there are many people, there's going to be a physical sign in the flesh of every descendant of Abraham that they are believing in the promise of God to do this. And, and that's the, the point behind the circumcision by Abraham obeying God and making this mark in his flesh and in the flesh of his child and those that come after him he's saying I believe the promise of God to the point where I'm willing to put it on my body as a reminder and on the organ of procreation because this is a promise of procreation so that's the deal behind the circumcision and then it says in verse 10, every male among you shall be circumcised. You'll undergo circumcision. It'll be the sign of the covenant. Now, this is interesting. Verse 12, for the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised. Amy, this is where I need Dr. Dan to help me out. Is there any medical benefit to doing a circumcision on a baby on the eighth day as opposed to other days? This is what I read. I don't know if any of this is true or not, but I read that there's a there's less bleeding in the child on the eighth day. Okay, what else did I read? That 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 was the best day in terms of the blood clotting. There's a there's the most amount of clotting factor in a child's blood on the eighth day or something like that. Um, the other reason for doing the circumcision on the eighth day would be it would be the day after the rest from the creation, signifying I'm going to make a new creation of this child. So, but anyways, I'd be interested to know if there's any medical benefit. First, 50, verse 13, my covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. Remember, Moses almost got put to death by God in Exodus chapter 4 because he had not yet circumcised his child. And his wife intervened at the last minute before something would have happened. So God says, this is an everlasting covenant. I take this seriously. Now, later on, the Jewish people will 
make the mistake of assuming that because they have been circumcised, they're automatically saved. And that's not the case. Paul's going to argue later on in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, that when it comes to salvation, circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't mean anything. What counts is a new creation. What counts is faith expressing itself through love. So circumcision doesn't save, but it's a sign that you're part of the covenant and you believe that God is a keeper of the promises of the covenant. But if you want to be saved, you still have to repent and believe and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Paul argues that vociferously in the book of Galatians as well as the book of Romans. Genesis 17, verse 15, God also said to Abraham, you know, I'm not just changing your name, Abraham. I'm changing your wife's name. As for Sarai, which means my princess. By the way, guys, your wife is your princess. Treat her that way. You are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. Well, what's the difference? Sarai is my princess. Sarah is princess. So before, Sarai was Abram's princess, but now she's a princess of the whole world because she's going to be the mother of the line of people that lead straight to Jesus Christ. Verse 16, I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. He's being very specific. It's going to be through her, even though she's pushing 90 years old. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. That's why it's Sarah instead of Sarai, because she's the princess of us all. Kings of people will come from her. And how does Abraham react in verse 17? <laughs> he starts laughing. He called me the father of many, and I got one kid. <laughs> He's going to give me children through Sarah, even though she's 90 years old and I'm 99, even in a day and age where people lived longer than they do now, they weren't having kids normally in their 90s at this time in history. Abraham says, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Verse 17. Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live before you. Was Abraham wavering in unbelief? Was he doubting the promise of God? Or was he laughing because it was just so amazing to him that God was going to do this? I'm leaning toward the latter. The reason why is because Romans 4, 19 says Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. That's actually Romans 4, 19. 19 to 21. So Abraham didn't waver through unbelief, but he was laughing just because it was crazy wonderful. You know, how, how is this going to be? And this kind of reminds me of John the Baptist. Remember that story where John the Baptist's dad was like, well, how can I be sure of this? Although, how can I be sure of this from him was a statement of unbelief. And you remember Mary when Gabriel told her that you are to have a child and you're going to give him the name Jesus. And she said, how can I, um, how, you know, how will this be since I am a virgin? Luke one thirty four. She didn't say, you know, the house is, you know, why is this, or is this really going to happen? She just wanted to know how it was going to happen. So verse 19, God said, yes, Ishmael's going to live under your blessing. But your wife, Sarah, you know, amazing as it sounds, she's going to have a kid and you will call him Isaac. And by the way, Isaac in Hebrew is Yitzhak and Yitzhak in Hebrew means he laughs. Abr you know, God said, you're laughing with joy over the situation. We're going to call the kid laughter. Remember the song by Michael Card? They called him laughter for he came after. The impossible promise of the Father came true, or something like that. Jeannie knows it better. She'll be singing it as soon as this devotion is over. So, verse 20, as for Ishmael, I've heard you. I'll surely bless him. I will. There's more I wills for Ishmael. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers. Remember, a lot of those Arab nations are going to come from Ishmael. I'll make him into a great nation. Verse 21, but my covenant is going to be established with Isaac. He is the chosen one.
And this is the part of Islamic history where they have a real hard time with that. They want to believe that Ishmael got the promise, not Isaac. And so that's a big difference in the Quran is that they make Ishmael and the Arab people the ones that God has chosen to bring the deliverer. Let's see, verse 22, when God had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. So Abraham actually saw a vision of the Lord. He didn't see the fullness of what God looks like, because no man can see the fullness of God and live. But he saw a likeness and a representation of God, and then God whoosh, went up from him, kind of like the angel of the Lord whoosh, went up from Gideon's father, Manoah. In Judges chapter 13. Check that story out. Verse 23. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household were bought with his money, every male in his household, and circumcised them as God told him. So Abraham obeyed the Lord out of faith that God had the power to do what he had promised. And so today, my message to you is to remember the God who says, I will. When God says, I will, God will. <laughs> He's going to accomplish his purposes and his plan and his predestined work in your life. But you got to repent. You got to believe. You got to receive. And out of love for God, you live a life of obedience to God. And he's provided us with the ultimate descendant of Abraham. He's provided us with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died, Christ rose, and Christ is coming again. Give your life to the one who gave his life for you. Give your life to the one who's the fulfillment of all the Abrahamic promises. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's been wonderful to be with you. Stay warm, stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow where God visits Abraham again in Genesis 18.